After working with creatives for the last 11 years, I've heard one statement more than any other. I hate marketing. I get it. It can be painful trying to figure out how to market your book or movie or comic. When I started podcasting, I had no clue how to do any of it. I was afraid of doing it wrong, looking like an idiot or making a marketing mistake that I could not recover from. It can be paralyzing. Sound familiar? If it does, let me see if I can help you. I got my MBA in marketing, so you don't have to. Sign up for a free session today to talk about your marketing goals and to see if we're a good fit. If nothing else, you'll get some insights that might ease your mind. Go to SouthgateSmallBusiness.com and sign up for a free session today. Welcome to Alley Chats. I'm your host, Rob Southgate. Alley Chats is a virtual artist alley featuring interviews with artists, filmmakers, podcasters, writers, really any creative person you might find at a pop culture convention. My goal is to help draw attention to cool people and to hopefully help them get some new fans. I want this podcast to raise up these amazing people and to inspire you, the listener, to chase your dreams as well. You can follow Alley Chats on Facebook and join the conversation. I'll add more social media in the future, but for now, that's the best place to interact with me. You can also email me directly if you would like to be a guest or have a guest suggestion. My email is rob at smgpods.com. Today's guest is Christopher Bavard. He's been a writer of horror and crime fiction for more than three decades. Plus, he has one of the scariest horror book covers I've ever seen. And... He's a guest at the Books and Brews event coming up this August 3rd in Evanston, Illinois. There's a link in the show notes if you want to check it out. Anyway, here's Christopher. Chris, you know what? Why don't you jump in, tell people who you are, what you do, give a little history. You bet. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Thanks for having me, Rob. I appreciate it. Um, I've been a horror author for about 30 years uh, now, which seems impossible, but it's the truth. Um, yeah, I, I uh, published quite a few short stories, uh, several novels. I write crime fiction, detective fiction, as well as mainly horror fiction. Um, so I've got kind of a, a, a dual dual fiction hats there that I wear. Um, I also have a podcasting company called Sensory Eclipse Media, and we're what? just about to wrap, yeah, we're just what? about. To wrap I'm writing this one down. One. Oh yeah, all the links are on my webpage too. Um, we're about to wrap up the first season of um, our first podcast, which is a, a serialized horror podcast called Psychiatrix. Um, And I'll actually be releasing the transcripts for season one later this summer as a book. Um, so that'll Phenomenal. be phenomenal. You know, I oh thought, you my know, God, you're doing here. everything that I always talk about with people. Well, I, well, I think, you know, yeah, totally. I, well, I talked to people who, you know, a lot of people who love podcasts, but I also talked to people who are like, yeah, I can't get into audio books. I'm not a big podcast person. I thought, well, the podcast is essentially just a long first person monologue and so i'm like it, it would work as a book so why not release it that way um yeah, and i also totally. have i have a lot of irons in the fire i also have a um i'm obsessed with puzzles and cryptography and ciphers and things like that um games like that so i also have a, a puzzle company that i launched last year called midnight parlor puzzles and novelties and it's also on my website um and it's it specializes specifically in interactive narrative horror puzzle games um and we just launched our first uh, launched and completed our first successful Kickstarter earlier this spring for a multi-part um, kind of horror adventure tabletop game. So wow, I love yeah, everything. I'm you're hard saying. at work on a lot of stuff. <laughs> okay, so we're going to get a little business out of the way. All right, let's do it. Uh, because you opened it up, you kicked the door open onto the business I side of things. So right of- first of all, I'm going to check out Sensory Eclipse uh, okay. because I own this big podcast network. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you know anything about it, but I have. Yeah, I do. Okay. You have a title. Uh, it, yeah, uh, I'm executive producer of 150 plus podcasts. Didn't know it was that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, very yeah. impressive. Yeah, and there, there's more to that story, which we don't need to go into here. It's not about me. Uh, but one of the podcasts I do is called Go Fund This, where when people have a Kickstarter yeah. or a backer kit, I just have you come on and talk about that. So when you have one in the future, because you're going to have, oh, I will. One, yeah, absolutely. On. You've got an open door. Definitely. Let's All do right? it. Unless do this it. goes horribly wrong, and I have to tell <laughs> you to blank off yeah unless uh, i'm shamed by the horror puzzle community oh my like, god maybe. yes and then it's like no it's it's so toxic i <laughs> can't have him terrible. back on uh, uh, toxic fandom 
but door is wide open for that. And uh, That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. And then there's other stuff, but we can talk about some of that other stuff another yeah, time because we don't want to bore anybody. But I love it. I love everything you're saying. It's awesome. <laughs> I'm uh, glad, man. So you've been a horror writer for 30 years. Yeah. Uh, when I look at your Amazon, I only see a handful of books. Yeah. Was it, is it that you did a lot of short story work in that or is it like? Yes. The short okay. answer would be yes. Um, so in the night, I published quite a, quite a good many short stories in the 90s, back kind of in that golden era of, 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 uh, you know, s- small press indie horror magazines, Flesh and Blood, Mind Mares, and, um, you know, Cemetery Dance wasn't indie, but they were the, they were the flagship. They were kind huge, of. yeah. Yeah, but in, and I had one in there as well. But in, in the 90s, there were a ton of these little, you know, kind of mail order zines. There was a big scene for that. Um, a lot of, you know, people just, hey, I want to start a horror zine. I'll pay you a little bit, you know, 10, 20 bucks for a story. And a lot of people just doing that. And, and there were a lot of really strong indie horror authors back then kind of getting their getting their start with that. Yeah, uh, so I published a lot. Sure. There. Yeah, absolutely. Um, published a lot during that era. And then when I was in grad school, I actually shifted to um, screenwriting. And so I was working with uh, an agent who had some ties to Warner Brothers for quite a few years. Um, we developed a number of screenplays, a um, couple of TV series, things like that. Um, None of which, you know, ended up actually going into development. I guess technically some of them are still technically in development. Yeah, yeah uh, development goes, goes on forever. Yeah, exactly. So um, I did that for a few years and sort of sort of sidestep fiction a little bit just because I was so focused on that. But I, I got to be perfectly honest, I got really burned out on that. Um, and I, I took a little bit of a break uh, focused on music. I'm a musician as well. And I focus a little bit more on music. Um, the, the screenwriting thing was brutal. I mean, it was it was a lot of fun. And I will say it was, I mean, writing those screenplays kind of to deadlines and things like that, it was a fantastic exercise in terms of writing. So it was, it really taught me a lot as far as, you know, being able to structure things, being able to kind of self edit. Um, My degree is in all my degrees are in English and I'm an English teacher essentially. So at that, you know, it makes it a lot easier for me to kind of handle my own stuff as far as editing and structure and things like that goes. But the screenwriting gig was fun. It was just super intense. Yeah. Uh, in, in those years, I did actually write. I wrote three novels over the course of probably 10 years, none of which have seen the light of day. Um, and it was kind of it was the kind of thing where it was it was almost more of an exercise than it was an intention of, of releasing them. Um, I, I always kind of looked at novels because I had so much experience in short stories as this just impossibly daunting mountain. You know, what's funny is now that I've published I've published three novels, the fourth on the way. I'm I'm a lot more adept now at writing novels than I am at short stories. Something really uh, flipped. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's it's. I turn out short stories very slowly now. Uh, uh, interesting. And a, yeah, and I'm a lot more comfortable with novels as a format. And I don't know why that happens, well, but it's know, just something flipped. It's funny. I've I've heard this. Uh, in fact, the person I just interviewed. Okay, so here's a peek behind the curtain because I yeah. watch these interviews. It's not like it's happening in real time. But I sure. interviewed Edmund Stone and he was saying how he was doing all short stories and then he did his first novel and he went, it was like he couldn't go back. And then it all became yeah. novels after that. And uh, I heard Joe Hill speak. Uh, we saw him at a con one time and he kind of said the same thing. He didn't think he had a novel in him. And he said, you know, here's his dad, you know, Mr. Novel. Breaking out 60 novels. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, I'm I'm working this hard to get my my short stories out. And he said, I really didn't think I had a novel in me. And then he wrote, uh, it might have been The Fireman. And he said, whatever reason, once once he crossed over and it started writing, he said it was like, boom, I get it. I get how to write yeah. novels. And he said, you're not going to see as many short story collections out of him. Although then you've got his dad who's like, eh, I woke up today. I'm going to write you know, two short story collections and then I'll start on my next novel. Yeah. Unbelievable. That's so that's some supernatural, supernatural ability. Yeah. It is yeah. funny. I mean, it's, I still write short stories and actually my most recent, my most recent book is a short story collection. It's on my Amazon page it's called the mystery of lullabies. Um, and actually that collection, um, uh, you know, all this, a lot of the stuff I've published years and years ago, it's out long out of print, you know, and a lot of yeah. those things I was like, you know, I kind of hated that. And so I thought, well, why not, you know, <laughs> let it die out in the vine. And yeah, it's like, why not? Well, but, you know, so I, I basically mystery of lullabies um, compiles some new short stories that I'd written over the last few years, along with some of the old short stories that were out of print, including the one that had been in cemetery dance and stuff like that. So um, I kind of, that was a nice little kind of package to put together. Cause it kind of brought me up to where I am now, as far as short stories and whatnot go. Uh, yeah. I still write them. I still enjoy writing them. It's just, I'm very slow at it. Whereas yeah. I used to be able to turn them out pretty quickly. Now, most of that energy goes into novel work, you know, which I'm you know, fine with. It's Yeah, you don't sound upset by it. 
No, it's fine. It's, <laughs> they're, they're all, I mean, it's the same process, essentially. It's just sort of, you know, it's, it's just a different, different approach to storytelling, you know? So were you always a, uh, I mean, if you went for English and all that, you obviously wanted to be a writer yeah. <clears throat> or involved in that world. Was Absolutely. it always horror? I mean, it's obviously oh, yeah. horror now. But was it always like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what was yeah, the I've been a monster what, kid since I was about three years old? What was the thing? Three-year-old you, what's the thing that we were I like, mean, this just gripped my life? I don't, I, I don't know that there's a one, one thing I could point to. I mean, I was, you know, I was, I was just a Midwestern kid obsessed with kiss and obsessed with monsters and just, I mean, it was, you know, there are probably a million other people like me. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing we're in, we're in a similar age bracket because yeah. and you're, are you from the Chicagoland area? Yeah. I'm from downstate Illinois. Okay. So yeah. son of Sven Gulli was happening for you. At oh that yeah, time? absolutely. Yeah. 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 See when, when people start talking about it with me, I bring up like son of Sven Gulli impacted us like as much as star huge. Wars impacted oh, us. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, Sven Gulli was huge. That uh, and the, uh, the four thirty movie. Yeah. You come home and like ditch your homework because they're showing Planet yeah. of the Apes again. And you'd be like, it's ape week. I am done. <laughs> it's like, well, I have to, I, I'm duty bound to sit down and watch this. That's right. And then whatever they, yeah. there was some Saturday matinee and I don't yes. know the name of it, but you remember they showed really weird yes. horror movies. Cause it was, was it on WTTW? Yeah. It was something like that. Yeah. 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 I think so. And, and my, uh, like my parents, I'm an only child. They were like, get outside, That's go same. out. And it was like, That's yeah, so but it's, I it's Saturday at one or whatever. And they're yeah. going to show Billy, the kid versus Dracula. There is nothing you can do to make me go Get outside. Get me away from this television set. <laughs> day of the Triffids happening today. Day yeah. of the me sitting on my butt watching it is happening exactly. today. I mean, so yeah, I get it. There's no yeah. one thing. Comic books were huge for me. I mean, I'm still a huge comic collector. I've always been obsessed with EC. I've been an EC yeah. collector for many, many years. Um, as you well, can you've see. got a Tales from the Crypt shirt on. I mean, uh, yeah, I have, and I have Tales from the Crypt all over my office. I'm a huge EC collector. I'm obsessed with Creep Show from the time it came out. You know, I yeah. got the Creep over there on the corner. I don't know if you can see. Love um, it. Yeah, I'm, I'm obsessed. I was, I was really, I, something just clicked with me when I was very, very little. I, I don't, I don't know. My parents were, you know, they, they enjoyed horror movies. They were super supportive of it and, you know, bought me monster toys and stuff. So um, it wasn't like I was having to like sneak the comics. My parents were buying me the comics, you know, right, so right. I, I had, I had a, I had a good kind of framework for, for getting my feet into this, but yeah, no, I mean, I've just always, it's in my DNA, man. I just, I, it's, it's just who I am. Okay. Always has been. But, but here's the question about it. It was in your DNA, just like I'm saying it was in my DNA. But were you a scaredy cat as a kid? Like, did you see this stuff and go like, ah, because. Very early on. Yeah. I mean, my parents took me to like haunted houses and it's all I wanted to do was go to the haunted house. And then I would cry my freaking eyes out. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. Okay. So you were that kid too. Yeah, yeah, totally. My my two flashpoint moments like that as a kid that I know that I know were things that happened was when the first first poltergeist came out. Uh Uh-huh. And, you know, they were... you saw the commercials. It's like, oh, this is going to be great. And I I very famously in my family, I was seven years old. And my dad, against his better judgment, was like, all right, fine. We'll go. We'll go. Thinking, you know, it's PG. It's Steven Spielberg. It's going to be fine. Like, yeah. not knowing the whole controversy over, you know, paying for the rating. And it's supposed to have been an R rating and all that whatnot. But we go. Packed house. Friday night. We're like fifth row. I stand up at one point and turn to my father <laughs> and said, we have to leave. And it'd be mean for you to make me stay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we did stay. We did stay. Okay. I, I, will, I will tell you, I, I finally, he was like, sit down, sit down, sit down. He's like, okay, we'll leave. But if we leave, we're not coming back tomorrow when you think you can. And I was like, he's right. like, well, do whatever you want. But he had uh, your number. Because that was me what, too. He had yeah. Your number. I got to sit here. I got to sit here and ride this out. You know, and you wrote but, it out even when the clown under the bed showed up. The clown under the bed was the moment where I really felt like I might have a seven year old heart attack. Yeah. It was, that was, that was, that <laughs> was think, the moment where I broke. I, I, at this point, I have a 56 year old heart attack when that clown comes out from under the bed. We just watched it last summer. We, we, we set it up on our deck and we watched outside, showed my daughter poltergeist for the first time. And she's, it holds she's up so well. Now. Oh, it does. She's 17 now. And oh, she, she's a horror writer. And, you know, oh, so nice. we're watching it. She's yeah. like, this is awesome. That clown comes out. And my wife and I are both like, nope, maybe we should turn this off. And she's like, what are you talking that about? That clown we're- is brutal. I don't know brutal. what it is specifically about that clown. Yes. But it, and part of it, I think, was the face change. Yeah, you know, you're not like what, what, when for it me, flashes. It, and- yeah, it's it just oh my god. But that and then when I was very little, when I was like barely three, um, telling all the hilarious Bavard family stories here, I my dad was you know my mom was at work. It was late night. The Blob was on TV. I mean, of all oh, things, yeah. The, the I mean, I love one, blob, though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm you know 
I'm barely walking around, right? I'm three years old. I'm asleep in my car, you know, and he's just like, whatever. He fed me and he's watching TV. Well, apparently I had woken up at some point and seen some of it and it, it processed in some capacity in my head. The next morning, my mom, completely oblivious, gets up. We're having breakfast. She walks over. I'm eating toast and she walks over and she's like, oh, honey, you've got a little blob of jelly on your finger. Let me get that. And I went berserk. <laughs> I was screaming and crying and freaking out. And she's like, what is happening to my child? My dad gets home and she's like, what is going on with Chris today? And he's like, what do you mean? She tells the story. She's like, I can just see your dad like, oh, boy. Like, oops. Kind of doing the- oops. Yep. So, yeah, let me tell you what happened last night. Uh, yeah. Oh so, yeah, the blob and, and poltergeist absolutely scarred me as a child. But beyond that. Yeah, through all of that, there was still just this fascination with it, you know, which just turned into just an obsessive love for, for somehow. I, yeah. Want more shows like this? We've got a lot more on the Southgate Media Group Patreon page. Some free, some paid. Plus, there's exclusive content for subscribers only. Follow the link in the show notes or look up Southgate Media Group on Patreon and check out the cool stuff we're doing over there. You won't be sorry. On August 3rd, 2024, Books of Horror is presenting Books and Brews at Double Clutch Brewing Company in Evanston, Illinois. There will be over 40 horror authors for a book signing and meet up from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. that day. Meet your favorite authors, discover new authors, meet Books of Horror friends in real life, including the author I'm talking with on this podcast. Oh, and uh, I'll be there too. This is an all-ages event. Food, alcohol, and non-alcoholic beverages will be available. No outside food or drinks will be allowed. Search for Books of Horror Presents Books and Brews on Facebook events for more information, or click on the link in the show notes. I hope to see you there. So has horror writing, has like diving in that way, has that taught you anything about yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for me, you know, my my philosophy on horror I, and, and, you know, if we want to get real cerebral with it, I mean, in terms of just kind of the role that it plays, I mean, obviously, you know, we all kind of accept this idea that, you know, horror helps us kind of come to terms with traumatic things um, in some sort of safe, cathartic way, right? Um Writing horror for me, like when I when I write a horror story, you know, obviously I, I I focus very heavily on the horror elements and I want it to be as creepy and as as disturbing as it can be. But for me, the context for that has to be something rooted in reality. Mm-hmm. I mean, there has to be like I, I I am not a big fan of horror that's just completely off the rails, you know, in fantasy land where it's just like there's no possible. I can't ang- I can't tie this to anything that feels real. Sure, you know what I mean. Like, and, and it's a sliding scale, obviously. I mean, you know, but I think for me, when I write a horror story, when I write, you know, whether it's a novel or a short story, whatever it is, the context for me is usually something tangible that's relatable to people. You know, um, I think you know the novel that I'm currently working on that will come out um, probably early next year at this point, probably in January. Uh, it's called All to the Slaughter, um, and and that novel for me, I realized as I as I was getting into it, it you know obviously it's it's kind of a grindhouse horror to slasher novel, I mean, and it's a lot of fun, and I'm really enjoying writing it. But what I realized is a large part of it is really about people coming to sort of coming to terms with aging. You okay. know, and it wasn't intentional. It wasn't. It wasn't like the kind of thing I'm like. I'm going to sit down and write a novel about you know Gen X getting older, but it kind of turned into that. You know, where it's like it kind of turned into this like rumination on like what it means to age and what it means to see things change around you in a way that you don't like, right? And and, and I think for me, those kinds of elements really need to be. There needs to be some sort of of relatability in terms of what people are going through in a horror story. For me, that's what I kind of go for, and that's the challenge of it. I think. Sure. Uh, and when you have that, it makes the horror elements that much worse. You know, when when you have people that you care about, when you have people you can relate to, and then something, you know, catastrophic, supernatural happens, it's like, oh, my God. So that's kind of the <laughs> – that's what I try to anchor everything with. I don't know if I always succeed, but that's what I try to go for. Isn't isn't that true, though, of – it's so funny. I keep having these conversations uh, about – what horror does, how it reflects and all that. Yeah. And I think that the, the best horror where horror really works is when it is, it, it's not, how should I say this? Torture porn movies don't do anything right. for me. Okay. Right. All right. right. You watch them. They're visceral or whatever. Sure. Uh, it's the ones that tap into your fears right now 
Uh, it's the it's the books that tap into other parts of it that you go, yeah, they're not talking about. They're talking about aging. They're right. talking. It's like it's like it follows. Once people figured out what it follows is, it's totally. like that is really totally. upsetting. It is. It's that's a great. I love that movie. So and do I. Yeah, it's. I think I thought that was a, a, a. I mean, I know it has its audience, but I thought that was a really underrated horror film in in recent years, just because of of all of that. Yeah, it's very unique. I saw a really yeah. interesting article about it follows not long ago too, talking about if you watch the if you watch the details in the movie, it's sort of designed to be the story that exists out of time. Yeah. The devices that the kids are using aren't devices that actually exist. These old exactly devices and stuff. It, it, it's, it's very kind of disconnected from reality. Like yeah. it's it's bizarre. But it it does, it's not like flashback bizarre. No, it's right. not like like oh wait a minute are they stuck in the fifties? It's like no, right. it's kind of modern age, but it could be. Anything, it's going to go for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. There's the question. We're going to get for a hard hitting question here. So uh, oh, buckle up. Hit me. Top three horror movies, whatever you're thinking they are right now. Right oh, I now. can do that. I can do okay. that. Let's hear it. Yeah. The thing. Carpenter. Yep. My number one. Um, Creep show. And then probably I would say Dawn of the Dead for me. Oh, those are, those are probably my top three. Not Creep show too. You didn't bring that one up. Oh, I like I like Creep Show too a lot, but the first Creep Show just has a magic that it's. No, I agree. Creep Show two, Creep Show two is is fun, but the first that original Creep Show, like seeing that in the theater as a kid. Oh my god, I saw it at the drive. Mind blowing. Oh, and it was just oh, it was it was it was just. I mean, that was true. It was truly. It sounds dumb. It, it that was a life changing experience for me as a kid. Like seeing doesn't that. sound dumb to me. Yeah, it's, it's actually funny. A few years ago, they did a, a horror night at a drive in out here, uh, and I went to that. And they showed Texas Chainsaw, which I'd seen, you know, a hundred times. Yeah. I'd never seen it at a drive-in and it's the first time I'm watching it. And it was like almost making me sick. You know, what's funny about that? It was weird. Yeah. I saw Texas Chainsaw in the theater uh, quite a few years ago now, but I hadn't seen it in the theater before. And I had seen that movie probably, you know, 50 times, a hundred times before that. It was a completely different experience seeing that movie in a theater. Yeah. Like yeah, seeing totally. it on the big screen with those speakers. It was it was almost overwhelming. I mean, it's like the 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 scene. That's what I'm saying. House. Yeah, it almost does make you sick. And it wasn't. And it's not even like a gore sick because it's not gory. It's right. almost like a motion sickness kind of sick. It was it was just a sight and sound kind of sensory yeah. thing. Yeah, exactly. But but I don't think it was like oh it was bad technology. So that's no. why you're having. No. no, I think it was designed to be the editing <laughs> setting. Yeah. 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 Um, those are all great choices. In fact, the thing is one that, that I talk about a lot. In fact, uh, on other shows, when I've asked something similar, people keep bringing the thing up, which is interesting yeah. to me because you're the first one that wore it on your sleeve. Like I do. Some are, are like, you know, this one is my favorite, but I know a lot of people poo poo or when I'm like, are you kidding me? How do you poo poo that movie? And what's funny is I I've heard that too. And I don't know anybody who doesn't love it. You know, it's kind of like, yeah. honestly, if I had to say there was a tie between Dawn for my, for my three spot, and this actually might edge Dawn out of the three spot, it'd be Halloween three. Oh, good with, call, man. With, without question. Uh, no, and that probably is probably number three over Dawn, honestly. Uh, Dawn will be my top five, but Halloween three is same thing. People for years. Oh, well, and then it turns out, oh no, we all love it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, now people understand. It. Well, I think the reason it didn't is because we were all, when it came out, we were all thinking it was going to be Michael Myers. And then you see yeah. this thing that's like. It's nothing like this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. now you can watch it as its own standalone. It's like, this is a fantastic movie. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and it actually goes back to the original idea. Halloween 2 only happened because it was like, well, I didn't, I could finish the story and yeah. they want a sequel. Okay. But it was supposed to be an anthology. Yeah. And and it wasn't supposed to be the story of Michael Myers over and over and over and over again. Oh. You know? And Halloween 2 was actually going to take place. The original the script was, was an apartment building, not the hospital. Right. It was going to, it was going to be years later. Yeah. Have you ever read any of those or heard about the, uh, the unfinished or unmade Halloween movies? Yeah. It's, it's been a while since I've read about them. I, I did. I don't remember a whole lot about them, but I know there was a whole slate of unmade movies that, that really sounded kind of interesting. There's one that sticks with me where somehow like he grows and becomes like, you know, attack of the, 30 foot Michael Myers. It's okay, like that one I don't giant... remember hearing about. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> I don't remember hearing about that. It's crazy. But at the same time, I heard it. I'm like, oh yeah, I so totally want to Oh, see I this. would yeah, I would absolutely watch that. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, yeah, me too. Did you see the uh the thing prequel? Yeah. I've had it on Blu-ray 
since it came out and I have yeah. yet to watch it. I've heard basically people hate it, but then I'm like, but it's the thing. You know, here's the here's the thing about that. And that's funny you mentioned that because I watched it not that long ago again. Um, it's not one I revisit very much. Okay. Um, but it's not it doesn't deserve it doesn't deserve all the hate, I don't think. I mean, I the biggest the biggest strike against it, honestly, is the CGI, which is pretty much symptomatic of the time it was made. Sure. You can't really fault them. Um, nobody was really doing practical effects at that point. They're just during that little window. The mo- the monster effects are good. the the idea behind them. The concept is cool. It's just you know it's the CGI is a little distracting. Okay, but honestly, if the way I kind of looked at it last time I watched, it, I'm like, if these were practical effects, I'd probably be really into this. You know, I mean, it See, does, you know, that's a that's what I want the story hear. from b- before the first movie pretty well. I mean, it does a, it does a nice job of contextualizing everything and, and and the way it's tied to the initial you know the Carpenter movie is actually it's pretty deft. I mean, they do a good job of keeping it roped in. Yeah, so the CGI is what probably killed it so that it didn't get probably continued probably. on. There's a whole yeah. thing with that movie, too, uh, where there, I think there was a TV series that somebody was working on. There was a, a sequel, and they all sound like crazy, but like yeah. the people behind it were so passionate about the whole thing. They're like, I can't have them out in the snow with this thing just going. I have to have it. It escaped, and now it's in New York, or it's escaped. And now, yeah. like, and to me, I'm like, I. It doesn't taint the original. I want to see all of that. No, that's an interesting idea. And that would be the natural progression of it, of course. So, I mean, that, yeah, it makes total sense that that's where they'd go with it. So what qualities do you think make, I know I'm taking a hard right turn here, but I I, I have a oh. writing question. What yeah. qualities do you think make a good horror story? Oh, man. I mean, I think it really kind of depends on people's individual writing styles in a lot of cases. I mean, I think... Right. You know, I mean, and it also depends, I think, on what kind of, of horror you're talking about. I mean, if somebody who's really super into like splatterpunk is, you know, I, I would hope that they would read my stories and enjoy them. But my stories, you know, a lot of them are a little bit more of a slow burn. They're not splatterpunk, you know. So somebody looking for that kind of charge out of the writing, you know, that kind of that kind of graphic intensity. I mean, it's there to be had in some of my stuff, but it's not going to be the same sort of context. Right. It's not going to be structurally the same. Um, I think, you know, a, a great horror story, it needs to be relatable in some way. And that's assuming you don't just want to, you know, if you want the, if you want the Son of Spanguli B-movie horror story, cool. If you just want a, a gross out monster story, cool. There's a lot of ways to go about that. I mean, but for me, a really good horror story, I need to feel connected to what's happening somehow. I like a slow burn. I, I yeah. like sort of a, I like that, that just sense of impending dread that you cannot get away from. And that's what I really tried to capture in Junkman and, and. What I what what I'm proud of, what I like about the the reviews that I've gotten on that is that's that does come up. People are like, it's this that sense of dread where you just know something horrible is coming down the tracks is there the whole time, and it just builds and builds and builds, which is really what I try to go for. And now I we, think you know, honestly, it speaks to the thing. It speaks to a lot of those movies. You know, the thing starts out so innocuously, and then it just oh, yeah. goes to hell. You know, <laughs> everything just goes to hell, and that's kind of the way I try to approach my own stuff. You know, it's like. Yeah. yeah. So I think, when I mean, I think a good horror story, it needs to be. I, I think it, it, it. The more an author can kind of step back and think about the way in which a reader is going to take the events, you know, and 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 maybe not worry so much about the roller coaster and worry more about you know what's going to really make them uncomfortable when they get up from their chair and have to go turn the porch lights off. You know, like what's what's gonna really upset them? <laughs> right. What what's gonna stick with them when they go? You know, they the the dark street outside the you know where they've lived for however long scares the hell out of them. You know, that's the kind of thing I try to go for. I think, and and that's maybe a very individualized response, but that's my that's my that's what gets me going, and that's what I try to try to go for. Pet Cemetery is a great example of that. Yeah, you know, it, it starts out such a you know it's such a just whatever. It's very Family. isolated feeling. Yeah, yeah, that sense of dread as things go along and the isolation becomes ramped up and just all of the elements that were there the whole time to be had. Yeah. Everything just gets worse and worse. It just closes in on you, you know. And have, I think- have you read uh Cabin at the End of the World, Paul Tremblay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That that to me, the feeling. The, yeah. the whole book, I was like so uncomfortable. Yeah. There's actually it, I'm not going to spoil anything, but there's a point in the book about halfway through where something happens that is so horrible. Yeah. 
I actually wrote to Paul on Instagram a, a message and I said, Hey, Paul, I just got to page, you know, 163, uh, loving the book. Go after yourself. Uh, this was horrible. <laughs> I was shocked. That, I mean, that really. So you do know exactly what it was. And oh, he I know exactly was like, haha. He's like, yeah, that was very upsetting to write. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm oh sure. Yeah. It was awful. awful. Yeah. But, yeah. But that book is for me, uh, one of the greatest horror books I've ever read. Like it's I, a I mean, phenomenal it's just, book. Phenomenal book. It's I haven't so seen so well movie. orchestrated. I haven't either, but I heard the movie's good. Yeah. I, I want to see those so. weird tools that they talk about in the book. <laughs> and they have them in the movie. I'm like, I want to see what the hell that is. So tell me about yeah. Junk Man. We we don't have a lot of time, but I want to hear yeah. Junk Man, the, the cover is so disturbing to me. Uh what is the what is the junk man? Junk so junk man is a story of a middle-aged bus driver. Uh, in a smallish, smallish town in Illinois, um, who basically is struggling with a number of things: uh, his mother's senility, his alcoholism, uh, failed marriage, things like that. Uh, he he inherits his grandfather's house, and as he's going through his grandfather's effects to, you know, presumably sell the house and just kind of try to start over, um, he comes across this um, Halloween costume, homemade Halloween costume that he and his sister. Uh, made many, many years before, and it kind of opens the floodgates on some terrible memories and some obviously horrible, you know, things go to hell quickly, as we were talking about. Uh, And the context of all of that is that his uncle um, is in jail for uh, having committed some murders, and he's known as the Jumpman Killer. And he became known as the Jumpman Killer. And the whole thing is, is, um, as one might expect, the whole thing is sort of tied back to the Halloween costume in the end. And then a series of very unfortunate things occur over the course of the novel. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, the cover alone and everything you just described is kind of what I was expecting. Uh, I like that. Good. Okay. Yeah. Cool. It's, that is going to be like top of my list at, at books and brews. I'm going to grab this book. Uh, so that's why you're on, uh, or that's how we came together here. Yeah. Uh, even though now that I know you don't live that far from me, I think we've now created a lifelong bond. I was saying, I think uh, we need to hang out. <laughs> I do think so. We might have to go down to Horribles. Have you ever been to Horribles? Oh, yeah. Horribles is great. Yeah, yeah. They have the TV from Halloween 3. They have the, the screen on when you sit there and drink your coffee. It's like, this is awesome. Uh, no, 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 not, not Horribles. Uh, uh, brood. The Brood. Yeah. That's Wonder the place Walker. that has the TV. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, the, you're going to be yeah. at Books and Brews, which is in yes. Evanston at Double Clutch Brewing Company, August 3rd. Uh, I'll put the links in the show notes. I'll put your social media links in the show notes so people can find you. Here's what I'm going to tell everybody. First of all, buy these books, uh, put the junk man up on your, your, your shelf and turn it outward. So you scare the hell out of everybody that walks in. Uh, (laughs) there you go. Follow Chris, get his newsletter, give him rates and reviews wherever you can. It helps and uh, definitely read his stuff and, and share it with people. That's how we get this stuff out there. Uh, and get people into it, which you know, or start a podcast network so you can interview everybody and make friends with them. That's what Fair I point. did. That's the long game. You played That's the long game. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Played the long and game. then also on his links, be sure to check out his podcast. That sounds incredible to me. And uh, and check out his games too. So there we go, Chris. I think we Thank did you it. So Thank much, you Rob. so much for being on, man. Yeah, I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. And thanks to everyone watching this and everything. See you at Books and Brews. It's going to be a blast. I'm going to have some new swag too. So New swag. I like that. Yes, sir. It would really help me out if you would rate and review this show on whatever platform you use to listen to this podcast. Good reviews help others find the show, which ultimately helps the people I've interviewed get more exposure. You can connect with me on social media or via email. All the links are found in the show notes. If you like this show, you'll like other shows from Southgate Media Group as well, such as Read Between the Lines, a podcast featuring insightful interviews with some of the hottest authors out there. Or go fund this, a podcast where we interview people about their amazing crowdfunding projects. You can find our shows wherever you listen to podcasts, so give them a try. And if you like what you hear, don't forget to rate and review our shows. It really helps other people find them and keep our team inspired. Alley Chats is a production of Southgate Media, hosted, produced, and edited by me, Rob Southgate. Thanks again for listening to Alley Chats.